Greetings, my name is Sakoti Bahia. I am a professor at the University of Guelph, work with the Department of Plant Agriculture. I started working on uh, the food related aspects um, of health a while ago, 25 years ago, and uh, I have been working on phytochemicals and nutraceuticals and their uh, mechanism of action for a while. Um, the chronic degenerative diseases uh, have been a big problem and uh, it is creating a big havoc in the healthcare system because um, there are cases when people have multiple chronic diseases and this complicates the uh, general <clears throat> performance of the healthcare system. As it is said, taxes it takes away a lot of resources to prepare the uh, um, damages caused by the healthcare system. Chronic diseases include uh, many of these cancers, type 2 diabetes, obesity, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, degenerative diseases of joints, etc., etc. And this has been recognized a long time ago by Sushruta. Um, for example, diabetes was called Madhu Meha, which, uh, it, which came from the uh, name of uh, honey like urine because a lot of sugar is secreted in the urine. And <clears throat> food, in addition to essential nutrients, contains several, several components. And mostly because of the, the extra chemicals that come from the uh, plant systems. And so many of these have biological activities because we evolved with these uh, families, with these food, with these plants. And so these bioactive components have a role in the health to play. And we are uh, increasingly recognizing their role. Traditionally, Ayurveda has been the medication system that recognized the role of phytochemicals in uh, uh, curing diseases. And so this Ayurveda also is going into a modern phase where it's getting much more recognized. Uh, in around 80, 1980 to 1990 time period, there were a lot of epidemiological studies which showed that uh, there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and decreased incidences of several of the chronic diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, etc. And based on these um, observations, the National Academy of Sciences in the US, they recommended uh, intake of five or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Uh, but very few people follow this uh, rule. Uh, uh, maybe people get one or two servings of fruit and vegetables per day, but that was their recommendation. And this has been followed throughout in Canada and in European Union, Japan, all across the world. So they have recognized the importance of uh, a high intake of fruits and vegetables. And because of this, uh, fruits and vegetables contain so many phytochemicals, such as uh, carotenoids. For example, tomatoes contain lycopene, that contains car the carotene, which gets converted into vitamin A. And in uh, many of the fruits, wine, um, etc., green tea, they contain polyphenols, which are or flavonoids, derivatives of uh, flavonoids. And polyphenols have a major role to play in the health, as we have, uh, we'll see in the future. Um, the quality the crucifer families, such as uh, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, they contain a sulfur compound called sulfuraphane, which has been known to enhance the detoxification capacity in the body and um, the antioxidant capacity. So the antioxidant capacity can come from the enzyme action, such as the action of superoxide, dismutase, catalase, etc. Um, the citrus fruits are rich in monoterpenes, such as limonene and limonene, and its uh, biological meta metabolite perlyl alcohol has been shown to um, be having handy cancer properties. Some, some of these have gone through stage three trials. The indole derivatives are also in the course of vegetables, again involved in uh, the detoxification mechanisms. The uh, allium family, garlic, onions, chives, etc. They contain certain sulfur components with um, cardiovascular uh, protective and um, several other health uh, antioxidant health benefits, etc. In addition, the herbs and spices, many of the Lamiaceae members, they have so many components in them 
and they all have been like, for example, policy. So this have been this has been recognized in Ayurveda a long time ago. So <clears throat> the <clears throat> phytochemicals in general provide uh, um, an antioxidant function, but they also have the property of active the modulating the activity of some of the enzymes. They can modulate the second messenger system. And also, they are also capable of um, changing or altering or beneficially altering the gene expression in uh, the biological systems. <clears throat> the, uh, this is the basic structure of the Fibonacci, which contains a benzopyrin and an associated B ring. And most of the derivatives either comes from methylation, in uh, hydroxylation, addition of glucose, addition of acetyl groups, uh, coffee oil groups, comadyl, comer oil groups, etc. So you get a variety of um, flavonoids and other cyanins, um, thousands of them. And um, so uh, there is a considerable amount of literature on the effect of uh, the activity of polyphenols on health, specifically cancer and cardiovascular properties. The cancer is one of the biggest issue problem because um, um, because of the, uh, the lifestyle modification that's happened in recent years and the type of food we take in, they have, we take in these can create so many problems within the body. And once the uh, cancer cell is initiated, the conditions are ideal for propagation of that and the development of the cancer. And this can happen because of several reasons. So there can be mutations to the uh, proto-oncogenes such as the hormone receptors, etc., which convert them to an oncogene and they work in an uncontrolled fashion. So that has been one of the difficulties. So the receptors can continuously signal the cell divide. And the other aspect can be the a lack of tumor suppressor genes. Tumor suppressor genes are you know, safe cut mechanisms so that if there is a damage to the cell in its, um, uh, the, during the transcription process, if the DNA is not replicated properly, then the tumor suppressor is inc increased within the cytoplasm and they lead the cell to a um, apoptotic or necrotic pathway if so the cell dies during the function. So these are protective, so this is a protective mechanism of the body to prevent the development of uh, chronic diseases such as cancer. So if you remember the, uh, the cell cycle, the cell cycle starts with the synthesis of DNA and there is a gap and then mitosis takes place and there's again a gap before the tendrils on the cell. So this is stimulated by a binding of a growth factor onto the receptor and if there is a mutation and a um, receptor has been converted into an oncogene, then it works uncontrollably. It functions uncontrollably, continuously dividing without the need for a growth regulator. And so this is what's happening during um, a mutation to an oncogene. Um, during the uh, division, now, as I mentioned earlier, that if there is a defect in the gene, this is detected by the cell, and then it starts accumulating the tumor um, suppressor products, the proteins like P53, adenoblastoma, etc. proteins that accumulate in the cell. So if this happens, if it's a smaller level, the can you repair, there are repair mechanisms in the DNA, but if there is too much of a damage, then the cell goes through an apoptotic or necrotic cycle and cell is dead. So this particular cell, which is damaged, does not uh, exist in the body. So that's the basic mechanism. So in a short, the tumor suppressors act as a break for the cell to stop the water division. And it's interesting to note that the many of the, the flavonoids and polyphenols, they can work on uh, various sites in the cell cycle by binding to the proteins known as cyclin-dependent kinases. So many of them can do that. And so that is the way the uh, polyphenols act. 
So the signal transduction cassette generally includes the ligands, like the hormones, the receptors, um, and probably transcription factors which are in the cytoplasm, which gets activated, and they can migrate to the nucleus and initiate transcription or translation process, transcription processes. And they may also be intracellular uh, signaling molecules. The major intracellular signaling molecules include the cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP. Uh, probably G proteins are also involved in this in some other way. Calcium ion is a major indicator. Inositol trisphosphate, which is generated from for, by phospholipid degradation by from phospholipid C action, and diacylglycerol. So the, uh, generally during this process, the transition from the information transfer from a receptor to um, the signaling molecules, there is an amplification. So one binding of, binding of one receptor can result in the activation of so many calcium, water sensitive calcium channels and there will be so very high increase in calcium ion. So the purpose is the amplification of the signal. So calcium binds to a protein known as calmodulin, and uh, calmodulin is a small protein, so 16, uh, between 16 to so 20 kilodaltons uh, in molecular mass, and this is the primary mediator of calcium signaling in uh, living systems. It's got a very high affinity, to, affinity towards calcium, so the calcium concentration in the cytoplasm increases from a basal level of below micromolar levels to just above micromolar levels, calcium bind to calmodulin, and it can undergo a conformational change. So normally there is an EF hand where calcium binds. And then once it undergoes a conformational change, then it can bind to specific domains and or domains of uh, target molecules, such as enzymes and proteins. And these gets activated. So that is the normal mechanism of activation of the calcium signal. So there are several enzymes such as um, cyclic pre-prime, high-prime nucleotide phosphodiesterase, which is involved in production of C cyclic AMP, adenylate cyclase, uh, calcium magnesium ATPase, calcium dependent protein kinases, etc. So uh, many of these are activated by uh, calmodulin at a very low concentration, and there are much more uh, Proteins than I listed here. Um, and uh, the sites were uh, the calcium calmodulin acts. It's like, for example, the cyclins coupled with cyclic, cyclin dependent kinases, CDCs and CDKs. And so these are the sites where calcium calmodulin acts. So it, there's been theory that. When there is an overexpression of calmodulin, so there's increased level of calmodulin in the cell, it can theoretically increase the cell division capacity of the cell because it, there are so many substrates. So this was one of the uh, induction in which we were uh, exploring the role of uh, polyphenols and uh, the calcium calmodulin function. So these are all the sites where calcium calmodulin can uh, act and inhibit the or slow down the cell division process. So we have been investigating the role of polyphenols in uh, um, cancer, what it does exactly to cancer cell, using two more particular model systems. One is the MCF7, um, which is the um, which is an estrogen receptor positive cancer cell line. And another uh, control for this, which is MCF10, which is a spontaneously immortalized uh, cancer cell line. So this is the electron micrographs of uh, the cancer cells that has been treated with polyphenols here, 50 microgram per mm. And um, these are the controls, which were not have been, which has not been treated with um, the um, polyphenols. You see that after three hours of treatment, the structure of normal cells is still intact. We can still see the nucleus, nucleolus, 
cytoplasm is intact, plasma membrane is intact. So the cell is functional. While the one that was treated with polyphenols has shows a totally disrupted structure within. So the nuclear membrane here, it's all disrupted. And you can see these membrane structures and it, it is totally out of organization. So this is the treatment has resulted in some kind of necrotic process within the cell. So initially we thought this could be an apoptosis. Uh, so we checked for it and it's not an apoptosis. So it is a necrotic process. When uh, the same treatment is given to the MC of 10, a control cells, you see that uh, this is untreated and this is treated. And there is no much difference between untreated and treated cells. You can see the nucleus functional, all the membranes are all intact. The only thing in difference is there may be some vacuolation. Other than that, the MCF10 signal, the cells are functional. We have repeat, uh, repeated this with other cell lines too, like uh, the pollen cancer cell line and some other cell lines. Polyphenols don't interfere with the mechanism of the normal cells. So what does the polyphenols do? So that was the question, do they affect the calcium level in the cell? So we can test it by loading the cells with a dye, calcium sensitive dye called calcium green. So calcium green enters the cell. And if there is an increase in calcium level, it binds to calcium green and increases the fluorescence, which can easily be monitored. So all these studies are done under a confocal microscope. So we are watching the cells, we are adding the polyphenols around the time period, the four minutes, and then following the fluorescence. So you can see that there is an increase in fluorescence in this particular group of cells in MCF7, in the cancer cells. But if you look at the MCF10 cells, you hardly see any increase in fluorescence at all. So this can be uh, from the, using the software in the microscope, you can calculate the increase in the calcium levels in individual cells. So we did that. And so the results are shown in this slide. This, uh, the y-axis is in nanomolars. I, uh, somewhere the, uh, the axis description has been lost. So, and this is time in uh, seconds. So this is around 20 minutes, um, uh, 20 to 25 minutes. So you can see that this is MCF7 cells and this is MCF10 cells, the, the calculated uh, uh, calcium levels or the fluorescence from the, from the cells. So the, in general, the basal level of calcium is much higher in the, the cancer cells than in uh, normal cells. So two to three times higher. And then after addition of polyphenols, you can see that in the calcium level starts increasing in the cell and then it drops. So you can see it increasing in several cells all at once, going up and then all, everything comes down after about um, 20 to 22 minutes. So this was a little bit of puzzling. So what happens to the calcium within the uh, cytoplasm? So that was what we were investigating. And uh, so we, what we uh, did was we checked the mitochondrial, the energy production status. So uh, the mitochondria exist in two, uh, two situations, highly, highly polarized and non-polarized. The polarized mitochondria is charged and get, that is the one which is functional and which is producing ATP. Um, so we can use a dye called a JC1, which stains mitochondria green when the mitochondrial potential is low. When the mitochondrial potential is high and functioning, it dimerizes, then it fluoresces in the red. So you can look at the ratio of the red fluorescence versus green fluorescence under the microscope and determine uh, whether there's a change in the mitochondrial membrane potential. So you can see this uh, top two panels are from MCF7 and the bottom two panels are for mcf 10 So I hope this is uh, clear. So this is the green channel and this is the red channel and this is the composite. So when you look at the MCF7, the untreated cells, you can see the red uh, fluorescence in the, uh, uh, from the mitochondria in the cells. While when it's treated with polyphenols, you hardly see the red 
the causation. So there has been something happened to the mitochondrial potential. So the polyphenols are affecting the biosynthesis of ATP within the uh, within the mitochondria. While the normal cells, MCF10, don't the cells don't show this particular phenomenon. So even after addition of uh, polyphenols, they are the mitochondria is still function. So the normal cells have an escape mechanism from polyphenols, while the cancer cells show the susceptibility to the um, depletion of ATP. The cancer cells are highly active. They need a lot of ATP. So if ATP is depleted, they don't have enough ATP. Cancer cells then go through an apoptosis or necrotic process. They die. Um, so under oxidative process, under the stress conditions like that, the mitochondrial calcium level increases because when calcium is released into the cytosol, mitochondria mops it, mops it up because that is one way the mitochondria, uh, mitochondria has a calcium transporter. And so at a low, a high concentration of calcium, it can take up the calcium from the cytosol. So once it increases, this disrupts the mitochondrial membrane potential. And this results in the apoptosis or necrosis of the cell. So this is what is, seems to be happening. So we also evaluated the, uh, um, the population of cells in the, uh, the group by uh, using the fluorescence assorted, uh, uh, fluorescence activated cell sorting. So from which we can get the cells in the G1 phase, the G2M phase, the synthesis phase, etc. So this is for MCF10A, uh, untreated and treated. This is for MCF7, the top one is uh, untreated, this one is treated. So if you look at the quantitation, uh, quantification of the, these particular peaks, so you can see that there is no change in the MCF10A uh, after treatment with uh, the polyphenols, while in the case of MCF7, you can see that the number of cells in this S phase is totally dropped. So there is a block in the, the, the gap one to synthesis phase, but this is, leads to a corresponding increase in the, the G2M uh, cells. So there's another block in the, uh, um, the G2 gap. So this affects the so this clearly shows that polyphenols can affect the uh, cell division process in cancer cells, but not in normal cells. So the normal cells are safe. So this is one way potentially for the prevention of cancer. So what we believe is that the presence of polyphenols within the body can create this sort of a situation if there is an abnormality arising in any of the cells. That cell is um, automatically transferred to Occur or uh, automatically tuned to either um, go through a necrotic pathway or a prototic pathway so that it self destructs itself. So we conducted further studies to see what the dietary effect of polyphenol intake will be using a mouse model. And so this is an athemic uh, nude mouse, so it doesn't have any hair. So this is a um, genetically modified mouse. It doesn't have its immune system intact so that we will be able to, we can transfer the cancer cells into these mice, it will grow. So you can feed the mice with the, whatever dietary component you want, and you can check the effect of the dietary intake of those components on the growth of the tumor. So what we used here was um, for our four systems, um, the control without any uh, treatment, just water, uh, given by Gavach, the, the polyphenols isolated from wine, red wine, and another fraction from the red wine, and the polyphenols isolated from Merlot grape, so which is a very concentrated uh, uh, polyphenol. It's, Merlot is a very nice uh, grape variety for winemaking. So we follow the tumor volume across the, during the growth, and by day 33, you can see that this is control, which is called approximately about 80 cubic millimeter. This is in cubic millimeter. Um, so that is our volume of the tumor. And um, 
So you saw the tumor in the previous slide and the treatment with the dietary polyphenols from the wine also reduce the growth of the tumor. And you can also see that the, in the mice group treated with the grape polyphenols, the tumor growth was almost totally arrested. So it's one of the first observation on the effect of dietary polyphenols on um, the zero, zero grafts, the cells that are trans, transplanted into a mice and uh, which was given a dietary um, uh, intake of poly, polyphenols. So this was an interesting study. So we further, oh, okay, sorry, this is the, uh, the tumor. So we also conducted uh, took the tumor, we isolate the RNA and we did uh, gene expression studies. So you see several of these um, uh, highlighted um, uh, the, the tables, the, the figures. Um, so what this represents is the ratio of uh, the gene expression in the, uh, the grape polyphenol treated versus the control. The control has if the control has higher gene expression, so this will be all be negative. And so what we find is that there is a drastic reduction in many of the key genes. So this is cyclic, cyclic dependent kinase, which is involved in cell division. FAS is a tumor necrosis factor family, uh, which is involved in increased inflammation. Um, so there are several others. For example, this is a lymphocyte enhancing factor, this matrix metalloprotein seven. All these are involved in cancer development. Ornithine decarboxylase, protein kinase C epsilon, protein kinase C A. So these are very close, very close to significance. Uh, uh, retinoid binding protein. So even vascular endothelial growth factor. This is involved in the development of blood vessels in the cancer cells. So that also was reduced. So there is a general reduction in many of the uh, in the expression of many of these genes after treatment with the polyphenols in the tumor. So it's essentially arresting the growth of the tumor. Sometimes factor, protein kinase C epsilon, um, prostaglandin endoperoxide and the cyclooxin is are involved in the prostaglandin device in this pathway. So generally so we find a reduction in um, in this. So uh, in general, polyphenols can cause an arrest in the, the growth of cancer uh, cells. And, um, but this has not been uh, verified by uh, uh, treatment in humans. So this may be a protective mechanism. So that's what we think at this point. So in addition to cancer, obesity is one of the biggest problems that we have. And the increase in obesity, the body mass, body mass index over 30, um, this has become a big problem because over 30 to 40 percent of the people in the general population in the world they are obese, considered obese. And the issue with the obesity is that this can also cause the uh, uh, creation of other type, other chronic diseases such as diabetes, stroke, colon cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a big drainer on the economy and the healthcare system. And primarily, obesity arises from the intake of bad type of food, foods. And uh, so avoiding these foods and adequate uh, exercise, not sedimentary, um, sedentary habit. Um, so these are much more important for controlling, uh, for controlling obesity. Um, the obesity can also cause problem with the liver by the accumulation of fatty materials in the liver called non-alcoholic fatty liver deposits or NASH in short. So this becomes um, the, uh, the, the, the fat is deposited in the adipose tissue by several hormones which promote this process. And in general, there is an increase in inflammation in the adipose tissue which gradually resettle in the development of the insulin resistance and uh, the type 2 diabetes. So, but this is another problem. The fatty liver deposits uh, are another problem for uh, the healthcare system. And if this continues, if the inflammation continues, the oxidative stress continues, then it goes to 
a cirrhotic liver, which is a non-functional liver. Curcumin, unfortunately, uh, is, uh, um, is a compound, a phytochemical that can moderate this particular effect. So generally, uh, there are so many components in the food materials, so some curcumin, capsaicin, which is a hot cup principle in chilies, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, resveratrol, which is uh, still being in uh, grape. So all these have the potential to redirect the lipid metabolism for, so that it is used as a substrate and burned off and instead of accumulation as a, as fat in the adipose tissue. So for these, um, there's an AMP kinase, uh, the system, uh, the PPAR are uh, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor alpha gamma, and uh, this is a co-activator of PPAR. So these can bind to specific elements in the genetic system, activating genes that are responsible for conversion of uh, the white fat to the brown fat. So the brown fat is rich in mitochondria. So they burn off the excess calorie, the excess fat stored in that uh, region. So that is the idea. So uh, the AMP kinase um, activates the CERT-T1. CERT-T1 is in uh, the nucleus, and CERT-T1 is another uh, intermediary in this. It's an enzyme, which D, this, this is an acet acetyl group or PPAR. So once it is deacylated, then they can bind to the their systems, the genes. And uh, so this can also open up uh, the uh, voltage sensitive channels, increasing calcium, increasing protein kinase, AA activity uh, stimulated by cyclic AMP. Again, these also um, enhance the expression of several of these thermogenic genes, the, the biosynthesis of mitochondria in white fat and such processes. And so in general, these are much beneficial. So one because the, um, the chronic degenerative diseases are a result of increased inflammation within the body. So activation of the inflammatory pathway is critical. And nf kappa B is an intermediary, it's a transcription factor which is involved in the uh, um, increase in the inflammation process. So there are several factors that can cause inflammation. For example, it can be lipopolysaccharides, it can be environmental conditions, it can be drugs, it can be so many, so many components. Um, so once that happens, um, the activity of NF kappa B is increased. So the, there is uh, an attempt to find several agents that can downregulate the NF kappa B activity. So there are several drugs also targeted for the reduction of the NF kappa B activity. Fortunately for us, the several of the plant components, particularly polyphenols, can downregulate the NF kappa B function. So these are, these are all the problem areas where NF kappa B is found to be more activated. For example, cytokines and chemokines. So these are the key into the production of the inflammatory response. These are also a guard, actually, because if there is an um, attack on the body by a pathogen, this will go up, but so that it's a defense mechanism. But when it increases too much, then the system starts breaking down. So uh, the activity of uh, NF kappa B is generally controlled through this inhibitor of kappa B, and uh, so this is normally bound together. So under the when there is a stimulus, inflammatory stimulus then I kappa B inhibitor get phosphorylated and they dissociate. So these two, the NF kappa B, they migrate into the nucleus and they bind to these, uh, the, their site binding sites and then start transcription process. And they cause the increase in the activity of several cytokines, including tumor necrosis factor, several interleukins, which are all inflammatory. So these are all causing the inflammation several chemokines. Um, so like the MCP1 and CCL1, um, the addition molecules, this is involved in cancer, anti-apoptotic molecules, so, so enzymes such as cyclooxygenase, 
inducible nitric oxide changes, etc. So all these are key to the development of inflammation response. And so these can be controlled by polyphenols. So they can moderate or downregulate the action of the nf kappa B. So that will be one way in which you can prevent or reducing the inflammation can prevent the development of chronic diseases. So this is a summary of all the, uh, the materials, the compounds, like such as alkaloids, terpenoids, phytosterols, polyphenols, all these components and what all things uh, it can do, the effect on these components. So this uh, slide summarizes all the uh, uh, effect of the plant components. So I, I didn't mention too much about the sulfur effects in, in the um, talk, uh, probably talked about polyphenols, sulfur, sulfur affines are in the Kussler family. They activate a system called as a KEEP1 NRF2 system. So the NRF2 is a transcription factor which is in the cytoplasm and it's not active under normal conditions. So once the components, the plant components come, they bind to KEEP1 and the NRF2 dissociates. And this dissociated NRF2 can migrate to the nucleus bind to what are called as antioxidant response elements. And so that causes the transcription of the antioxidant enzymes such as um, superoxide dismutase, catalase, peroxidase, et cetera. In addition, they also cause the, uh, the uh, synthesis of phase two and phase one enzymes which are involved in the detoxification of several components. So just the crucifers themselves can do all these processes. The immune response through nf kappa B, the AP1, NN, PAT, so these are the transcription factors um, involved in the inf inflammation response. These are T helper cells and um, this is the antigen uh, presenting cell. So if there's an extra pathogen, something entering, so antigen present cell activates the immune system, macrophages. So uh, monitor things can affect the uh, this particular pathway, which is the MAP kinase cascade pathway, MEK is the MAP kinase. So this is highly activated under cancer conditions. So uh, this can, polyphenols can interfere with this uh, pathway, uh, inhibiting this. As we saw earlier, when might, can, polyphenols can act as um, scavengers of reactive oxygen species. So, there are so many ways uh, in which uh, polyphenols can function in the case of passive carbonatory, et cetera. So the legend is uh, given here. You can read through later. And uh, thank you all. Then you are.